the presentation that we're um, that we're presenting today. Um, it has the title. It, it, we actually changed the title a bit. Um, so now the title is the role of labor in a socio-ecological transition, reconciling post-Keynesian and ecological economics theories um, on labor. Um, and yeah, as said, this is um, a paper by Stefan Amann and me. It's actually part of a bit of a, a bigger um, project. Um, we're also working on, um, on, on a model that formalizes um, some of the matters that we're thinking about. Um, and this part that I'm presenting today is really more um, the conceptual um, story or the, the um, a story that's a lot more based around the literature um, um, around it. Um, and I think, however, after our uh, discussions yesterday, I actually decided that I want to start um, with some preliminary remarks, which are also relevant for what we're doing, but also I think for the general um, discussions, um, because I think I, I do think that we need to talk actually about what um, what the degrowth literature um, is proposing and what it wants and what it claims. Um, um, to just make sure we talk about the same thing when we talk about degrowth, zero growth, um, and these kind of things. So I do want to start really briefly with um, this question again, what do degrowth people actually say what degrowth is? Um, and, and what they say definitely is de that degrowth is not negative growth in a growth paradigm, but it aims at liberating economies, societies, and the planet from a growth imperative. Um, it also is not a purely economic concept. The degrowth literature really does not come from economics, but it really started as a much more inter and transdisciplinary call um, for a transformation. It's not an all-encompassing reduction of material throughput, um, and it surely affects sectors and certain sectors and world regions a lot more than others. Um, and, um, and I think especially these first three are really important for the discussions that we're having in this format among economists. Um, there are then three further ones um, in this table that I took from Dengler 2020, um, which, which are maybe not as important, but also reinforce this idea that um, degrowth really started at least as a call for a repolitization of questions around well-being and um, a call to take planetary boundaries really seriously, even if that means that maybe um, we have to, um, in the global North countries or in the rich countries, at least um, think really hard about things like reducing consumption levels and reducing production levels. Um, and then what this entailed concretely, and this is also important for what, what we are doing in our paper later, um, and Stefan and I, um, is that um, that according to an early paper um, in the degrowth literature, De Maria et al., um, there are four strategies that degrowth proponents follow, which is activism, building alternatives, reformism, and research. And research here, as I said, it hasn't been economic research so much. It has been um, traditionally rather in political ecology, in anthropology, uh, sociology, etc. cetera. Um, and the building alternatives strand has also been really strong and um, traditionally where it was a lot more about um, the, the, the bottom-up initiatives, bottom-linked initiatives, the grassroots, the, um, yeah, the radical action on the ground, so to say. Um, and the reformism part that's really about thinking, okay, what are policy proposals for staying within planetary boundaries? This is something that emerged in the degrowth literature, um, I would say rather um, recently in the last um, five or years that has gotten a lot more attention. Um, and this is, of course, now what's also really interesting to, um, to economists. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's just relevant to kind of see where this is positioned within, um, within the degrowth discourse as a whole. And if we then actually look at the policies that are being discussed, um, we can see there's this one review article, for example, by Cosme et al. from 2017, which screens um, 90 or somewhat more than 90 peer-reviewed articles with policy proposals and says um, there are three goals, three policy goals that are, um, that are promoted. The first one is reducing environmental impact of human activities. And the type of policies that you see in there are actually not very different from mainstream environmental 
policy proposals such as carbon taxes, huge investments into a replacement of the capital stock um, infrastructures, etc. Um, but then degrowth is a lot, or degrowth, this degrowth policy debate is a lot more focused on um, the kind of more broader transformational aspects of it, where they say, okay, but this will, if we really take this serious and stay within the carbon budget, um, then this will really be such a huge deviation from how we in fossil capitalism right now are structuring economic activity that there will be most likely adverse effects on economic growth, at least in the short term, while we are replacing the capital stock. So we should do something about it. Um, so there is also this social target and there's also this more transformational target. Um, so there are, um, yeah, there are a range of policies that um, that I think are working are worth taking a look at um, um, for people who, who as post Keynesians want to think about or want to understand what um, degrowth people are really interested in. Degrowth people go, do not go ahead and say we should reduce GDP, but they propose all these policy proposals. And then these policy proposals, um, 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 they are presumed to probably have some impact and potentially adverse impact on GDP growth. Um, and here's just some further um, literature that stresses again also kind of this, both the fact that um, that that there is this more transformative um, idea that degrowth wants to push, but also that it has this aspect, for example, as we see in Carlos et al. of the Green New Deal without growth, which really also does, um, does um, entail heavy investment um, in, um, in economic growth. Um, uh, in, in, in green growth, I'm sorry, in green growth in the sectors, um, uh, green energy, for example, public infrastructure, um, etc. Um, so, so just to bring this together, the, the problem technically is not really the question what happens to our macroeconomy if we have zero or negative growth. Um, we kind of know that in the current system it's a recession. Um, it's also not really how can we have zero growth um, I mean, that might be an interesting modeling exercise, but, but that's not really the problem that drives degrowth proponents. The problem that drives them is how can we ensure human well being within planetary boundaries where human well being is not necessarily defined as ever increases in consumption levels? And following the sciences, um, degrowth proponents would then say that staying within the planetary boundaries is not likely under business as usual because, due to rebound effects, rates of decoupling and dematerialization are way too slow. Um, and business as usual, the growth proponents here would then define as market-based growth regimes. Um, and, and, and this entire discussion that emerged in the ecological economics literature around growth imperatives was then saying precisely that if we were to implement really strict carbon budget compatible regulations, or even just let's assume we're just using a purely market-based logic and really implement um, carbon taxes that would be effective, then this would have strongly adverse effects on economic growth and actually on well-being in the short run. Because um, if the carbon taxes um, were to be, uh, um, the, I mean, the relevant time frame to act is within the next 10 years, right? But it takes 10 years or so to replace a capital stock. Um, so if we are implementing a carbon tax that leads to the fact that everyone right now starts replacing the carbon tax, then this will really, uh, it will be such a um, radical um, um, effect to so many people's lives that this is something we just need to think about. Um, so part of the idea here is that to make effective climate policy politically feasible at all, we need to show how it can be done in a way that does not deteriorate living standards, increase inequalities, lead to recession dynamics, etc. And ecological economists, and this is now leading into what we're doing, um, they have a lot of ideas on policies but they are not very strong on macroeconomics and on the potentially unintended effects from certain policies due to macroeconomic feedback effects. Um, Beth, who was here yesterday, for example, wrote a paper um, on the risks of rent seeking in a resource constrained future, um, where she also made the case that as long as channels of rent seeking are still open, if we're just implementing single policies that are promoted in this degrowth um, policy debate, then um, it, it might actually lead to, to really problematic social outcomes because under this logic of growth and profit extraction, um, um, the, the, there might emerge dynamics that actually will increase inequalities. 
Um, and that is that's the case um, that um, that I think ecological macroeconomics should be making. Um, why we need economic, or why we or they, ecological economists, need um, macroeconomic frameworks to evaluate these policies. Um, and ideally, the frameworks that we're using, um, the macroeconomic frameworks, should be convincing. So from my perspective, that would be post-Keynesian frameworks rather than neoclassical ones. Okay, now this moves into the paper that Amon, um, Stefan and I are actually working on, where our argument now is that um, post-Keynesian models, which we should be using here, um, they are limited in their contribution to ecological and macroeconomics if they do not complement the predominant demand side of labor markets with post-Keynesian perspectives on labor supply. Um, or in other words, this is a very simple intervention saying post-Keynesian ecological and macroeconomists should think about labor. Um, and I briefly go through the ecological economic story, the post Keynesian story, and then how we in our paper propose um, a con conceptual integration of the two of them. Um, so ecological economics, as I already showed earlier this slide with the um, policies, we see here that, um, that the matter of, of work and of labor really features super prominently within um, ecological economics or degrowth literature on the policies. Um, that I think should be um, an interesting starting point for, for economists to look at. Um, and they feature so prominently um, that some have even termed, this is a nice quote, I think, um, that illustrates this, um, have, have started to conceptualize labor policies as the single silver bullet um, to, to ensure that the socio-ecological transformation becomes possible. Um, there is this, um, this, this argument around the productivity trap that um, Tim Jackson and Peter Victor um, have suggested in an article 10 years ago, um, where the idea is that if we continue to have product labor productivity increases as we've had, um, then of course there are two channels. If we want to keep employment stable, there are two channels um, of, um, of, of what might happen to keep employment stable. Uh, employment stable, either consumption would have to grow. So that's just presumably that virtuous cycle um, between economic growth and um, labor productivity increases. Or um, if we do not want to, for environmental reasons, keep on increasing consumption, then working hours would have to fall. That's where kind of this focus on, um, on, on labor comes from. Uh, on the one hand, the threat of unemployment, if we say that most likely we want to shift out of so many destructive economic activities that GDP is likely going to fall, um, or also um, in terms of this potentially promising aspect of decreased working hours, which might not only solve, um, solve the matter of unemployment, but might also really transform the way we actually live our lives. Um, which again, thinking about where degrowth as a discipline comes from really makes a lot of um, yeah, makes a lot of sense in, 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 in their terms of thinking um, that it's a lot about these meta issues on, um, on, on value change, the good life, et cetera, at all. Um, so, so there are some policy pres prescriptions that we see here, such as work time reduction, which features very prominently or shifts to um, low productivity sectors. It's also something that um, Tim and Peter have been discussing, um, but something that, that that we were wondering about a bit is to what extent um, labor is here conceptualized as a supply issue. And, and Amon and uh, Stefan, my two co-authors, they, um, they are not degrowth scholars um, per se. So it was really interesting also um, for us to get together and start thinking about, um, okay, but how, if we take up these policy proposals from the field of degrowth, what would that actually mean in terms of, um, in terms of putting it into a, um, a uh, sensible um, macroeconomic model. Um, uh, ecological economists, I would say, are most often not very explicit about whether they want to frame labor as a supply or a demand issue, but the, it's, it seems to be implicit that, it's, that there is some sort of um, supply dynamics that's really prominently featuring here. Um, for them, where, for example, they have this idea of the scale effect argument that if people work less, then less is produced, and then the overall output will decrease and emissions will decrease, um, 
which of course is is not clear um, here yet where demand features in, except for assuming from, from this perspective that people would demand less labor. Um, but that of course would, would be a very different story. Um, so they would supply less labor that, that uh, of course, in terms of um, the, the labor market and um, because they would want to work less. Um, but that, that of course is a story that 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 doesn't really make as much sense or it, it's not at first sight clear how that makes sense in a post-Keynesian um, in a post-Keynesian labor market story that is really demand driven. Um, so let's look at that for a second. Um, so the post-Keynesian labor market, and it's here in quotation marks because um, of course it's not a for post-Keynesian, it's not a market in the Volrasian sense. Um, where we have market clearing, where we have um, um, some sort of equilibrium outcome at the intersection of supply and demand. Um, and in fact, what is interesting, I think that there is no specific or no unified um, post Keynesian theory of view of the microeconomics of labor markets. And the reason for that is, of course, that labor is not a normal good. Um, and it is really a um, that, that labor demand is derived demand that really comes from the goods market. So the action happens in the good markets, good market, and also the policy intervention that post Keynesians talk about tends to take place a lot more on the goods market um, than on the labor market per se. Um, so here, just again, the very schematic um, or a very schematic way of representing the neoclassical labor market and the post Keynesian labor market. Um, where the post Keynesian labor market, the demand for labor, um, it, it, it's really established elsewhere. It's not established on the labor market itself. And of course, this is really relevant for post Keynesians as well, right? Because per this, um, per this result, post Keynesians can have an explanation of involuntary unemployment, which neoclassical economists cannot really um, convincingly explain um, structurally involuntary unemployment. Um, so what I did in my master thesis then, which we want to build up upon now, is um, that I dived into the literature of post-Keynesian um, uh, post who, who think or thought about labor, um, demand, labor supply, and demand supply interactions, um, and would say that there are, if we look at this, even though there's no unified theory, there are a bunch of principles that emerge from the literature. Um, and that it might make sense to arrange them in a way to have a narrative of the post Keynesian labor market that can then in a conceptual way be, um, be contrasted or made compatible, et cetera, with the economic economics, um, ecological economics um, perspective. Um, so to go through these three, um, three elements and four principles um, very briefly, um, the demand side story, everyone is probably very familiar with. Um, the, the principle here that really matters is that aggregate demand accounts for involuntary unemployment. The left hand, very schematic um, um, graph. This is how Mark Setterfield, who I've been studying post Keynesian economics with for the past two years here at the New School, um, uh, in, in a very um, sim simplified way, um, tries to bring across the main idea of post Keynesian um, labor demand where employment outcomes are really a residual of what happens on the other markets. Um, of course, there are um, also further contributions um, as shown in the Labra textbook um, below that try to construct um, a bit more of a detailed version of labor demand. But um, the overall idea I think that's relevant is that it's a um, residual, and therefore we have involuntary unemployment. Um, then there's labor supply, and and um, we think this is actually really interesting um, in itself, also because labor supply is not as much discussed and as much formalized in post Keynesian economics. Um, even though there are some post Keynesians that did really think about these um, these matters, Robinson in 1937, for example, already observed that um, it's not really it doesn't really make sense so much empirically to think of labor supply as upward sloping, um, because a reduction in wages tends to make people work more, not less, at least in terms of in the lower wage segments where you have to in order to keep your living standards. Um, 
and you consume out of wages, you have to increase um, increase your labor supply if wages fall. Um, so an income effect pre uh, pre dominates over the substitution effect, um, which is really this vital necessity to work. Um, and then above this vital necessity, we do have um, a social component as well. And then post Keynesian economists have started thinking about satisfying behavior, emulation behavior, et cetera. Um, and some post Keynesians have tried to construct um, labor supply curves, even though there's um, a lot of work here potentially to be done which is really interesting um, for ecological economists who tend to think about um, labor in this more supply framed um, matter as well. Um, so if we bring that together as a sort of kind of story, post Keynesian story of the labor market, we could say that already by the principle of involuntary unemployment and the necessity to work, we already have a sufficient explanation for why there are power imbalances on the labor market. Um, but these then are mediated, of course, by policies and by institutions. Um, so the policies and institutions that post Keynesians also always um, talk a lot about a lot, they are necessary not only for securing full employment, um, but also actually for mediating the effect that unemployment had. If we look more on the side of the question of the um, necessity to work that we are faced with in a certain society. And this, we would then argue, would be one potential um, integration point between, at least on a conceptual level, between ecological economics and post Keynesian economics. Um, so, to quickly look at that, um, as, as I argued earlier for ecological economists, it's really policy driven. So if we look at some of the policies that actually um, are suggested around the topic of labor and ecological economics, um, then, then we, we tend to see the following, um, the following um, fields in general. Um, there's this idea that we should create jobs in sectors and industry that we do want to see grow in our economies, even if aggregate GDP growth will likely stagnate or potentially even decline some sort of Green New Deal, then to deal with the consequences of stagnating or declining GDP growth that we get from, from heavily moving out of a destructive economic activity, existing employment should be shared more equally, some sort of um, work time sharing, uh, work time reduction, work sharing, job guarantee. Generally, people should have to rely less on wage work for survival, decreasing the vital necessity of wage work by decommodifying labor. Um, that's why a lot of degrowth peeps talk about universal basic income or basic services. And then there's lastly this idea um, that a value change is called for to decrease not only the vital but also the social necessity to work in order to allow for people to step outside the circle of wage work and market consumption, um, allowing for a greater role of unpaid labor and need satisfaction provided by commons. So it's sort of recommoning. Um, and if we now say that these are the, the fields of policy making within ecological economics, and of course, every field itself can you can design a UBI or a Green New Deal in very in, in hugely different ways. Um, but if we take these as the overall general areas that ecological economists are interested in, then we can start comparing that to the story that post Keynesians are making around matters of labor. Um, and there, um, what well, we would see is that on the left hand side, you have this idea of stimulating demand, so the kind of Green New Deal and the work sharing matters. Whereas on the right hand side, which covers more the supply side story, um, we would have matters around decommodifying labor and the value change, the UBI, UBS, recommending remunicipalization, remunic um, et cetera. And we can now use this, of course, to, um, to think about what post Keynesians so far have thought about a lot and what maybe they haven't thought about so much, and thus um, what might be avenues for further research um, that, um, yeah, that might be interesting um, to combine the post-Keynesian macroeconomics with the, the policy proposals from the ecological economics perspective. Um, and if we look at that then, um, so again, our, our, our main argument was that um, post-Keynesian ecological macroeconomics economists should think about labor and um, should think about what ecological economists claim that how labor should be treated um, and think about whether that makes sense or actually doesn't make sense. Um, so far, post Keynesian economics has focused more on stimulating demand to decrease involuntary employment. 
Though other tools like the work time reduction and the job guarantee, they are being increasingly discussed. Um, so this would be a very um, straightforward avenue to, um, to, to see how um, for PK scholars, such proposals related to degrowth scenarios or scenarios where we actually stay within the carbon budget, if we want to frame it that way. Um, and then linking post Keynesian perspectives on the vital and social necessity to work. So the more maybe supply side post Keynesian story with issues around climate change and aggregate growth has not yet been explored, but might potentially be highly interesting to the degrowth literature. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And uh, also keeping within the, the time lim limit. Thank you very much. And uh, we go directly to the next presentation uh, discussing inequality by Antoine Montserrat. I, I hope I pronounce it correctly from the University Sabon Paris.